want to take a moment and tell a story about three different groups of people. Now, this is a true story, and it's based on the Supreme Court decision. And ultimately, what you have is you have one group of people who are uh, nonviolent felons. An example of this is a, is a man who uh, lied about food stamps uh, to such a degree that it became a felony. And then he was told he wasn't allowed to own guns because of that, uh, because he signed for suit food stamps illegally. Then you have another party, the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ultimately had said that you can't do that, that during the New York Rifle and Pistol Club versus Bruin case last year, uh, you can't do that. Uh, this is, this, he has the right to own a gun under the Second Amendment, and you can't restrict him because of nonviolent felonies. And then there's the third party, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, this particular court was quoted as saying that decision had revolutionary implications because that same man that signed for food stamps, the 11th Circuit Court had to rule that based on the Supreme Court decision of New York Rifle Pistol Club and Bruin, they have to let this man have his Second Amendment rights. Now, what is up with this revolutionary implication? Because that's a strong, that's strong language. And ultimately what you have in the 11th Circuit Court is every single judge in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals was appointed by Obama, Biden, or Bill Clinton. Only two justices, one was appointed by Trump and one was appointed by George W. Bush. The rest of them were all appointed by Democratic presidents. And ultimately now they're saying, well, the revolutionary implications revolve around this idea that they're making decisions that they disagree with, that they're forced to make these decisions that they don't believe are right, but they have to make them because of the New York Rifle Pistol Club versus Bruin case, which says you have the right to carry a gun outside your home because ultimately the Heller case from the 90s said you have a right to own a gun, but only in your home. So then many states and cities said, well, you're not allowed to leave your home without that, with that gun unless you're going to the gun range, which you can't stop it for gas. You can't do anything other than go straight to the gun range and straight home. And then, then last year's decision said that you have a right to own a gun outside the home. But it was the verbiage that really by Clarence Thomas that kind of opened up the door, which said that you have to look at history. You have to compare it to when the Second Amendment was written, what laws were on the books for guns, and there weren't any. So now what we're seeing is we see federal judges uh, that are very liberal that are really struggling to make these decisions. Uh, it goes against what they believe. It goes against what they think the law says. But because of that, that Bruin decision in New York, they have no choice. Um, and quoted from the 11th Circuit is that has caused revolutionary implications. Uh, but that's too bad for them because it's right. There were no laws on the books when the Second Amendment was written. And you can't tell a nonviolent felon that he can't own a gun. It's just as simple as that. Any thoughts or insight, definitely put that below. If you like this video, click like and subscribe. If you'll call to support this channel, Patreon, the link is also below. But the most important part of this channel is we take prayer requests. So never hesitate to send that in. Thank you for watching this episode of God, Family, and Guns. And as always, love God, love your family, and love guns.